Mr. Ernest Worthing who is my guardian. It is his brother, his elder brother. Ernest never mentioned to me that he had a brother. I'm sorry to say they have not been on good terms for a long time. Oh. Oh, well, that accounts for it. Now that I think of it, I've never heard any man mention his brother. The subject seems distasteful to most mm. men. Oh, Cecily, you have lifted a load from my mind. I was growing almost anxious. It would have been terrible if any cloud had come across a friendship like ours, would it not? Of course, you are quite, quite sure that it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is your guardian. Quite sure. In fact... I am going to be his. I beg your pardon? Dearest Gwendolyn, there is no reason why I should make a secret of it to you. Our little country newspaper is sure to chronicle the fact next week. Mr. Ernest Worthing and I are engaged to be married. My darling Cecily, I feel there must be some slight error. Mr. Ernest Worthing is engaged to me. The announcement will appear in the Morning Post on Saturday at the latest. I'm afraid you must be under some misconception. Ernest proposed to me exactly ten minutes ago. It's certainly very curious, for he asked me to be his wife yesterday afternoon at 5.30. If you would care to verify the incident, pray do so. I never travel without my diary. One should always have something sensational to read in the train. I am so sorry, dear Cecily, if it is any disappointment to you, but I am afraid I have the prior claim. It would distress me more than I can tell you, dear Gwendolyn, if it caused you any mental or physical anguish. But I feel bound to point out that since Ernest proposed to you, he has clearly changed his mind. If the poor boy has been entrapped into any foolish promise, I shall consider it my duty to rescue him at once and with a firm hand. Whatever unfortunate entanglement my dear boy may have got into, I will never reproach him with it after we are married. Do you allude to me, Miss Cardew, as an entanglement? You are presumptuous. On an occasion of this kind, it becomes more than a moral duty to speak one's mind. It becomes a pleasure. Do you suggest, Miss Fairfax, that I entrapped Ernest into an engagement? How dare you? This is no time for wearing the shallow mask of manners. When I see a spade, I call it a spade. I'm glad to say I have never seen a spade. It is obvious that our social spheres have been widely different. Shall I lay tea here as usual, Miss? Yes. As usual. Interesting walks in the vicinity, Miss Cardew? Oh, yes, a great many. From the top of one of the hills quite close, one can see five counties. Five counties? I don't think I should like that. I hate crowds. I suppose that is why you live in the town. Quite a well-kept garden, this is, Miss Cardew. So glad you like it. Miss Fairfax? I had no idea there were any flowers in the country. Oh, flowers are as common here, Miss Fairfax, as people are in London. Personally, I cannot understand how anybody manages to exist in the country, if anybody who is anybody does. The country always bores me to death. Ah, this is what the newspapers call agricultural depression, is it not? I believe the aristocracy are suffering very much from it just at present. It is almost an epidemic amongst them, I have been told. May I offer you some tea, Miss Fairfax? Thank you. Detestable girl, but I require tea. Sugar? No, thank you. Sugar is not fashionable anymore. Or bread and butter? <laughs> bread and butter, please. Cake is rarely seen at the best houses nowadays. <laughs> Hand that to Miss Fairfax.
You have filled my tea with lumps of sugar. And though I ask most distinctly for bread and butter, you have given me cake. I am known for the gentleness of my disposition and the extraordinary sweetness of my nature. But I warn you, Miss Cardew, you may go too far. To save my poor, innocent, trusting boy from the machinations of any other girl, there are no lengths to which I would not go. From the moment I saw you, I distrusted you. I felt that you were false and deceitful. I am never deceived in such matters. My first impressions of people are invariably right. It seems to me, Miss Fairfax, that I am trespassing on your valuable time. No doubt you have many other calls of a similar character to make in the neighborhood. Ernest! My own Ernest! Gwendolyn, darling! A moment. May I ask if you are engaged to be married to this... young lady? <laughs> to dear little Cecily? Of course not! What could have put such an idea into your pretty little head? Thank you. You may. I knew there must be some misunderstanding, Miss Fairfax. The gentleman whose arm is at present round your waist is my guardian, Mr. John Worthing. I beg your pardon? This is Uncle Jack. Jack! Oh! Here is Ernest. My own love. A moment, Ernest. May I ask you, are you engaged to be married to this young lady? To what young lady? Good heavens, Gwendolyn. Yes, to good heavens, Gwendolyn. I mean to Gwendolyn. Of course not. What could have put such an idea into your pretty little head? Thank you. You may. I felt there must be some slight error, Miss Cardew. The gentleman who is now embracing you is my cousin, Mr. Algernon Moncrief. Algernon Moncrief? Oh! Are you called Algernon? I cannot deny it. Oh! Is your name really John? I could deny it if I liked. I could deny anything if I liked, but my name certainly is John. It's been John for years. A gross deception has been practiced on both of us. My poor, wounded Cecily. My sweet, wronged Gwendolyn. You will call me sister, will you not? There is just one question I should like to be allowed to ask my guardian. An admirable idea, Mr. Worthing. There is just one question I would like to be permitted to put to you. Where is your brother Ernest? We are both engaged to be married to your brother Ernest, so it is a matter of some importance to us to know where your brother Ernest is at present. Gwendolyn, Cecily, it is very painful for me to be forced to speak the truth. It is the first time in my life I have ever been reduced to such a painful position. And I'm really quite inexperienced in doing anything of the kind. However, I will tell you quite frankly, I have no brother, Ernest. I have no brother at all. I have never had a brother, and I have certainly not the smallest intention of ever having one in the future. No brother at all? None. Had you never a brother of any kind? Never. Not even of any kind. I'm afraid it is quite clear, Cecily, that neither of us is engaged to be married to anyone. Not a very pleasant position for a young girl to suddenly find herself in, is it? Let us go into the house. They will hardly venture to come after us there. No. Men are so cowardly, aren't they? This ghastly state of things is what you call bunbring, I suppose. Yes. Perfectly wonderful Bunbury it is, too. The most wonderful Bunbury I've ever had in my life. Well, you have no right whatsoever to Bunbury here. That's absurd. One has a perfect right to Bunbury anywhere one chooses. Every serious Bunburyist knows that. Serious Bunburyist? Good heavens! Well, one must be serious about something if one wants to have any amusement in life. As for your conduct toward Miss Cardia, I must say that you're taking in a sweet, simple, innocent girl like that is quite inexcusable. To say nothing of the fact that she is my ward. I can see no possible defence at all for your deceiving a brilliant, clever, thoroughly experienced young lady like Miss Fairfax. To say nothing of the fact that she is my cousin. 